Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we're going to get back. I missed a spot. Um, we're still going to be talking about uh, Sunday. The next section is Protestant on the Protestant Catechism, Sunday Continued. Um, the reason I'm hammering this home, brothers and sisters in Christ, is as we're watching this, you're going to realize that we've already talked about in the last two studies. They talk about the Lord's Day. They create their own holy day, and they're claiming it's a commandment of God. And as we're going to see here is they try to say it's a commandment of God, and then they're going to go to the words of man, and they're going to equate the words of man with the words of God in the sense that they don't equate it with this. They're trying to say that man's word's God's word. So uh, make sure you have your King James Bibles out and pause the video and turn to the different sections that we're going to be talking about. I go through a lot of scripture, which is why I just follow, follow along here. And sometimes I will open the Bible for short videos, but this one's probably going to be a long one. So let's get started. Remember, this is a question and answer. They, uh, the, like the Protestant Catechism and other, the, it's really Catholic we're realizing. They'll ask a question and they'll give you their answer. Okay. So the first question is, what is the testimony of uh, Asabius? It's spelled E-U-S-E-B-I-U-S. -E okay. The great historian concerning Sunday. You gotta watch out with this, brothers and sisters of Christ. When someone goes to a church father, I'm gonna scoot this up a little bit. When someone goes to a church father and tries to say, what does man say? Get ready, because I wanna say nine out of 10 times, it's gonna be feelings and opinions, and it's not gonna be based off scripture. What's the answer? From the beginning, Christians assembled on the first day of the week, called by them the Lord's Day, for religious worship or read the scriptures to preach and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Okay. We already talked about this in the last one where Paul, they met one time, it mentions one time that they met on the first day of the week to talk about the word. And when it said they broke bread, you can read other times in here where Paul broke bread with people. It's talking about eating. He ate with people. It's not talking about communion. It's not talking about the Eucharist. Okay. If I'm using that correctly. Right. So, let's go here. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. I put it down here so we can go through it again. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, didn't say every first day of the week, this is just one time. Paul, they, no, I'm okay. I'm not saying they couldn't have done it more times. I'm just saying they saw one instance that they came together on the first day of the week and they take that instance and say you're supposed to do it every day of the week. I mean every Sunday of every week throughout the rest of your life. They're adding to Scripture. Okay, Paul preached unto them ready to part on the morrow and continued his preach until midnight. Now, stop there for a second. We're in Acts uh, 20... We did seven, we're going to be going to eight. Um, if you actually look into the Jewish day, and I believe they had it right, the Jewish day was from six to six. You have 6 p.m. all the way to 6 p.m. the next day. Then the new day started. That's how you were listening to them. They didn't have Jesus on the cross until midnight. Okay, It was coming close to 6 p.m., the end of their day, and that's why they broke the legs of the two thieves. And when they came to Jesus, he, looked, he was already dead, and they just pierced his side. Okay. So he continued his preach until midnight. Now they're using, I believe, our midnight. So Paul preached un into the next day. It wasn't just Sunday. They preached, he preached all the way into Monday. I'm going by ours, but like I said, their days were probably different, or are different, the Jewish calendar. Verse 9, And there sat in a window a certain young man named Euchus, I'm going to butcher that word, Euchus, being fallen into a deep sleep. Like I said, they preached, he preached into the next day. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, 
See, they broke bread again and eaten, that it mean they did communion, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. All the way into the next day. How many of these could they grab this verse and say, everybody's been doing it. See, it's all about tradition. Okay? They did it from the first day of the week, called them the Lord's Day. I've never heard that. I mean, I was raised in the Babel buildings. I never heard Sunday being called the Lord's Day. But they've transformed it today where they've taken all these titles out and it's just traditions of men. Period. But as we see here, he preached all the way into Monday. How many of these Babel buildings do you see doing that? They're going to grab this verse and make it standard every Sunday you're to meet together. Why don't they follow exactly what's going on here? Why aren't they having dinner together? Why aren't they preaching all the way, all day Sunday, all the way into Monday, the morning of Monday? Right? Why aren't they doing that? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. And when I come, whomsoever you sh shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberty unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now is this Paul saying, hey, I'm going to be there on the first day of the week so we can do communion and do our, you know, follow the Lord's day. No, he's saying he's going to show up on the first day of the week. And we talked about this in the other studies. We're going to show up on the first day of the week. And I'm going to get all these donations that you're donation, donating so I can take them to Jerusalem to give to the poor and whatnot. And he said, if I can go, I'm going to go with them. They're going to pick someone to take it all. Okay? So if it was about, you know, they have to meet together every Sunday on the Lord's Day, why was he saying he's willing to go with them to Jerusalem to take all that stuff? Right? If, verse 5, if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. So they take these two. Because it's kind of hard, I had to go through scripture, because a lot of this that we're going to go through is man's words. They went and tried to use the Bible, and we disproved everything that they were trying to use the Bible to justify it, meeting every Sunday. And now they're going to go through man's words. So, now, real quick, called them by the Lord's Day. I wanted to go over this one more time. The Lord's Day, they try to say, has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, the question I'd ask is, where is it called the Lord's Day? Where is it ever in Scripture that that first day of the week is the Lord's Day? Uh, sometimes they'll call it Risen Sunday. You've got to come to church on Risen Sunday. All right. That's where they're getting it from sometimes. But oftentimes it's just the traditions of men. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 also says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me that work iniquity. That's what's going on here, brothers and sisters in Christ. What they're doing, and I'm seeing together in this study, uh, the Protestant Catechism, what they're doing is, they're basically taking Saturday, the Sabbath day, that's a commandment of God. If you're a Jew, you have to keep the Sabbath day to be a Jew, or you're excommunicated, if you want to say it like that, okay, from your people in the Old Testament. So today, what they're doing is they're transforming that into Sunday, the Lord's day. And you've got to keep that to be a good Christian, or you're not a Christian at all. How many of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, have been persecuted because we don't go to the Babel buildings? Okay, We want to study the Word of God, and we want to know the Word of God. And you're not going to find that in these Babel buildings. Okay? I've, ha I've heard stories from you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, on how you learned more when you truly got saved and got away from these Babel buildings than you ever did in these Babel buildings. When I first got saved, going through Bible-believing ministries online, 
true Bible believing ministries, I learned more in the first few months than I did my whole life as a fake Christian in these Babel buildings. But they're telling you it's a work that's necessary. Not a good work that you can do. Some people do it, some people don't. They're saying it is necessary. In other words, if you're not saved, they, they make it part of salvation. You have to show up or you're not a good Christian and oftentimes they'll say you're not a Christian if you don't go to these Babel buildings. So the next one uh, I wanted to put in here, talking about it, I had to read a little bit. The day of the Lord. Okay, you have the Lord's day that they're trying to say the Lord's day. But the Bible says there is a day of the Lord. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was where we find it, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. To, live, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. There we see it again. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Now, as also ye have acknowledged, as in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. What is this day of the Lord? Uh -huh. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay. At the end of the a time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus comes, that starts the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Remember, a day is as a thousand ye years, a thousand years is as a day. Okay. The thousand years, the day of the Lord, is the thousand year reign. We call it the millennial kingdom millennial thousand years of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on the earth okay? and we read a lot that talks about today you've got to suffer for Jesus Christ okay? if you suffer you shall also reign with him suffer for him you shall also reign with him but as we see there is a day of uh, there's the day of the Lord but you won't find the Lord's day in Scripture what you're gonna find it is you're gonna find it in man's writings Okay? It's not in Scripture, which is what we read there. Now, I have to read this again, Colossians chapter 2, 8. When they said, hey, what does this one guy say? The great historian. Great historian. So he's, you got the Word of God down here, and he's way up here. Now, if someone goes to quote somebody, and that person that they're quoting is quoting Scripture, and standing by what word, God's Word says, and he's a church father or something, yeah, I can see that. But oftentimes, as we just read there, there was no scripture. He didn't use God's word at all. This word came down here, and he's a great historian. Okay? What's going on here? Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It started out as the tradition of men. If you follow all this, it starts out as philosophy okay? and vain deceit. Like we just read there, okay? It said, for religion, um, from the beginning, Christians assembled on the first day of the week. They're saying it like it's every Sunday they assembled. And they called by them the Lord's Day. Uh, chapter and verse, the early Christians, where they're calling it the Lord's Day, where they're meeting every first day of the week. It's not there. So what's going on there? Okay, the, the feigned deceit. Philosophy and vain deceit, it turns into the traditions of men. They start pushing that you had to build these little buildings and you got to call them churches and everybody's got to meet there on Sunday. 
then it become widely part of the world. It's the rudiments of the world. It's considered just normal. You're supposed to go to church on Sunday. It's just normal for anybody that calls themselves a Christian. You ask them, where do you worship at? And they're talking about a building. It's become part of the rudiments of the world. And what is the last part of that verse? And not after Christ. He didn't quote scripture at all. He didn't say the Bible says this and I stand for it and that's what I do and the people in my day, that's what we did. He doesn't quote scripture. He doesn't stand by the word of God. So the next question they ask. What does the Apostle Barnabas say of the first day in an epistle which is attributed to him? This is, like I said, this is supposed to be a Protestant catechism. Barnabas. Here's the answer. We joyfully celebrate the first day of the week in memory of the resurrection of the Lord. Right? And it says, wake apo apo apostolic, if I can pronounce it right, epistle, page 242. And I had to look it up because I was like, it's not in scripture. What is this? It's a tract known as the epistle of Barnabas. was probably composed in A.D. 135 probably. And when I look into it, it's uh, part of the biblical apocalyptics. If I can pronounce that right. There's a lot of big words. Okay? I'm like chapter and verse, so it's almost like saying uh, the Apocrypha books. Okay? It's something outside the Bible. It's not part of God's Word. So, like I said, they went to try to use God's Word in the first few studies, and now they're translating to saying, well, men say this, and you know what? You're supposed to obey both. And what does Peter say? It's best to obey God rather than man. Right? We're to obey God rather than man. Not best. You're going to get messed up when you start obeying man over God. Right? Acts chapter 2, 7. Oh, we already did that one. Bottom line, once again, first day of the week only happened once. So I almost want to go through the, all those verses again because it's just the same thing. Uh, but Acts chapter 20, verse 7, I just want to read that verse real quick. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. I want to talk about the breaking bread here. Right? In Acts chapter 27, 34, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from your head of any of you. And when, ye, when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of, all, of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Now you read the whole story of what's going on with Paul. They're on the ship. They're about to crash into this island. And he's telling everybody because they've been fasting because they're scared. They think they're all going to die. And he tells them they need to eat some meat. Okay? He broke bread with them. When the guy fell down dead, what did we read? He got up, gave him some food, and Paul went back to preaching. He didn't say, oh, he, he's tired, so i got to end my preaching. They went back to preaching. Matthew chapter 15, verse 34. And Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and brake them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Jesus broke bread. Does that mean they were doing communion? No. Where are they getting this stuff? From the traditions of men. Yeah. Communion is all about reflection on yourself. Your life as a, as a Christian, you're supposed to reflect on yourself. That's what communion is. Jesus died for your sins. Okay, You belong to Jesus Christ now. Are you living the life of Christ? How many, is there still sins in my life that I'm working, that God's working on me? Am I giving those up? Am I living right? Am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing? That's what communion is all about. It's not going to a building and eating some bread and drinking some grape juice. Okay? That's not what communion is about. Okay? It's symbolic in the sense that it's the, His body and His blood, but it's about remembering what Jesus did for you on the cross. You are now created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In my am I living the life of Christ? That's what communion is all about. Now notice they talk about Barnabas. Okay? He wrote his own epistle, and it's, it's God's word also. 
but it's not in God's Word. Mm -hmm. So when I looked up Barnabas, here's some times we, we learn about Barnabas. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So there we find out who Barnabas is. Okay? A Levite. And he's from the country of, of Cyprus. Turn to, go down to Acts, i go down, flip over to Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, how he, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. He was a witness. He brought Paul so they wouldn't be scared. Okay. Nowhere do we hear him talking about the first day of the week. Okay. You turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed cold, bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So here we have Barnabas going around with Paul, preaching the gospel with Paul. Okay. Nowhere do we hear about the first day of the week. Next mentioning of Barnabas, Acts chapter 15, verse 35. Acts 15.35, Paul also and, a, and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, which many others also, with many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we had preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pampilia, and went not with them to the work. In other words, Mark wanted to reap the fruit and benefits, the fruit, but he wasn't willing to do the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Okay, this is important. Notice that's all it says. Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Verse 40, And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Where's Barnabas and Mark doing that? Where's Barnabas and Mark being recommended by the brethren? Where are they going out unto the grace of God? It's not there. Uh, uh, Galatians chapter 2, 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. They're trying to grab from Barnabas. Right? They had such contention. Some people will use this to, they could agree to disagree. No, that's not what this is teaching. This is teaching that Barnabas was being a respecter of persons, and he was wrong. And he went his separate way. He wasn't um, confirmed by the church, uh, not confirmed, recommended by the brethren, and he didn't have the grace of God with him. And then we read in Galatians that what's going on there, 2.13, uh, the traditions of men that are trying to say it's not good for Jews to hang out with the Gentiles. Okay? He's following men over God's word. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Let's go through all of this. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. 
But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, see, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as, I'm going to start all over, sorry, my, I lost where I was, verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? That's what's going on here. Okay, Barnabas was going with what man was doing. Peter was falling into that. Does it mean Barnabas was lost? No. But I'm saying, when you read this, you see that Barnabas got sent his separate way. He went his separate way. He didn't have the uh, recommendation of the brethren, and once again, he didn't have the grace of God. It said, recommended of the brethren unto the grace of God. Yet they're grabbing a letter that he supposedly be writ, and we don't know that these letters are true anymore when it comes to a lot of this stuff. They just grab them to justify uh, someone could have made it up. But if they say it is true, that they found these letters by Barnabas, it was written after this happened. Are you really going to follow it? Ugh, bugs. Are you really going to follow that man and listen to that man? Okay. No. You follow God's word and listen to God's word. People... Um, Recommended by the brethren of the grace of God, Paul, who was given the commission by Jesus Christ. Okay, other times we see Barnabas. I just wanted to go through all of the examples of later parts of Acts through Romans. An overview of Paul's ministry. 1 Corinthians 9, 6. This is why I believe when you look at Acts and Romans, what I meant to say there is, it's an overview of Paul's ministry. Overall, from beginning to end. Then you have all the letters that he's writing the Corinthians. And we saw there that they parted ways. But then you see uh, Barnabas, as we're going to read here, he's being mentioned in the new t in, further on in the New Testament, in Galatians and uh, Corinthians. What's going on here? It's talking about that time period before they went their separate ways. Okay, before Romans. So 1 Corinthians 9.6 or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. I'm reading it to show that it's mentioned. Okay, Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. They made a trip together. This is still before Acts 15 where they went their separate ways. Galatians chapter 2 9. And when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Why did I want to read every bit of you could have just I could have just said, well, this verse, this verse, this verse. I wanted to read it because, brothers and sisters in Christ, where in here is Barnabas making that statement? Okay. Where is he making that statement? We joyfully celebrate the first day of the week in memory of the resurrection of our Lord. And they do communion. Okay. Where is he saying that in Scripture? It's not there. Where are they getting this? From the traditions of men. That's become the rudiment of the world. Okay. So next question they come up with. Remember, this is all to justify you have to go to a building that they call a church on Sunday. They've turned that into a commandment of God because the Jews have their day and the Gentiles have our day. Sunday. Okay? They make it out to be a commandment of God and it's nowhere in Scripture. And they're trying to bring you back under the law, because like I said, they changed the law. Okay? Kind of like the Pharisees did. Okay? Why did you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? They're trying to make it out to be the commandment of God and it wasn't. It was their traditions. Next question. What command did Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, give to the Magnesians concerning Sunday? 
Now, at first, I thought this was talking about Ignatius de Lola, if I'm pronouncing that right. So I started doing this whole thing on it, trying to show this guy was against uh, Protestants. Why would the Protestants mention him? But God opened my eyes and showed me that they're not talking about that Ignatius de Lola. Okay? Um, here's the answer. Um, then we'll talk about who he is. He bade them a lead a life conformable to the Lord's Day. Every Sunday. You have to be there. In memory of the Lord's resurrection. Being hymns, Antiquities, Volume 2, Book 20, page 1126. That's the reference they use. But Ignatius, uh, Bishop of Antioch, question mark. Because we know uh, this book goes back to Antioch. It's a Syrian book um, where Christians were first called Christians. Okay? So here's about an outline that I had to look up. Saint Ignatius of Antioch, also called Ignatius Theoprus. Okay, it's Greek for God-bearer. Let that set in. It's almost, like I said, it just sounds Catholic. They make up these saints and give them God titles, God bear, or godly men titles. Died uh, C. 110, I'm thinking that's A.D. 110. Rome. So how did he die in Rome if he's the Bishop of Antioch? I don't get it. Western Feast Day, October 17th when he died, Eastern Feast Day, December 20th. Bishop of Antioch, Syria, now in Turkey, known mainly for seven highly regarded letters, see that's where they're getting the writings, that he wrote during a trip to Rome, as a prisoner condemned to be executed for his beliefs, he was apparently eager to con counteract the teachings of two groups, the Judaizers, I can't pronounce that either, who did not accept the authority of the New Testament, and the diocese who held the Christ's suffering and death were apparent but not real. The letters have often been cited as a source of knowledge of Christian church at the beginning of the second century. Okay. We don't find it in scripture. That's the main point. This, I really couldn't put anything down. Okay, other than we sh should obey God rather than man. And other than putting down chapter and verse. And we've already read about the traditions of men. It's going off men's words. So that's where they get this guy. They're just going over and they're making it about man's words. Now man's word is equal to God's word. Now when I say something, when I'm quoting scripture and explaining scripture, it's not my words. It's God's words. When I'm quoting scripture... Now, some people might miss up the mess up, and I'm 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 not infallible. I'll make mistakes when I try to explain some verses, and someone will correct me. That's not really what it means. That's man's words. Sometimes when you describe this, but when you're reading from this book, you're reading God's words. When man's words, I go to explain it. If it doesn't line up with God's words, it doesn't mean anything. But they're going off solely man's words. They tried to use scripture and failed. So now this next part, they're just going off of man's words. And traditions of men, church fathers. And then they ask, next question, because I want to go through all the questions. When did Ignatius live? What does this have to do with the Lord's Day? These men, they're saying it's the Lord's Day. Where's the scripture to back it up? Now they're going off men saying it's right so you have to do it because man said so. But what does this have to do with the Lord's Day? When did Ignatius live? He was the disciple of St. John and was ordained by the apostles then living. Wait a second. You mean he was here? The times that we're reading about John and the other apostles, the, you know, there's 11 apostles, and then they have Paul that comes in, becomes the 12th apostle. Where is it written? Where is he mentioned at all in Scripture? Not there. Okay? They find this, let's see, the Caves Lives of the Fathers, volume 1, page 179. Not chapter and verse in the King James Bible. No. Um, now, we see here, as we keep going, men are being elevated above the Word of God. 
traditions of men are becoming, they're trying to claim are commandments of God. My biggest thing is chapter and verse, where is the disciple of John? Where is it saying in here that Ignatius is a disciple of John in Scripture? We just read about Paul. He took this person, he took that person, Titus. Barnabas was with him for a while. He had people with him. All right. But what does it mention, Ignatius? Not even in there. And when he lived, how does that have to do with the Lord's Day? It has nothing to do with the Lord. I don't, there is no Lord's Day. There's re, there's a Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. That is God's word. That's truth. But there is no Lord's Day where we do it every Sunday. Next question: What did Ignatius say to some of his disciples who wished to keep both Saturday and Sunday? Answer: He bade them not to keep the Sabbath of the Jews but to lead a life agreeable to the Lord's Day. Here is proof they're separating the two. The Jews have the, the Sabbath, and we have the Lord's Day. When did Paul get on, that we just read about getting on to Peter, trying to separate them when they're supposed to be one? Body of Christ, the Gospel. That's what they're doing here. Romans chapter 14, 5. What does this 14, 5 say? One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth thank God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. If you want to come together in a group, not in the building that's built and designated as a church, and they invite both saved and lost, lost to it, but like I have here, if I had brethren here, the one to come together and sit on the deck summertime and do a Bible study on Monday, go for it. Sunday, go for it. Saturday, go for it. Any day of the week you can come together. Now right here I still believe the context here is talking about holy days and Sabbath days. God ordained days that you're gonna find in Scripture. They're trying to say the Lord's Day is a God ordained day. You won't find it in Scripture. Man. Galatians chapter 3 verse 22 But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe but before faith came we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay? We're, remember we talked about that. The law of sin and death. That's when you're lost. The word death gets dropped off when you're saved. You're still held accountable to the law of sin. We're in this body of flesh that we're going to be tempted. We're going to fall into temptation. We're going to drop our cross. That's why the Bible says pick up your cross daily. Okay? We're still going to fail the Lord, and we're going to feel miserable, and we're going to, God's going to say, hey, get back up. Oh, you won't listen? He's going to chastise you to get back up on your feet. You really push him, he could kill you and bring you home early, and you're going to miss out on rewards. But you can pick up your cross daily, praise the Lord. He is faithful to forgive us. But the point is, is we're not held accountable to the law of sin and death. And that's what they're doing here. They're putting it under, if you don't go to church, these Babel buildings, go to church, which you won't find in Scripture, uh, you're not saved. You can even lose your salvation in certain Christian circles. Okay. So the question I ask you to ask yourself, brothers and sisters of Christ, is how is telling somebody they have to keep the first day of the week any different from telling someone they have to keep the Sabbath? There is no difference. Galatians chapter 4.21 
They're trying to bring people back under the law, but the law isn't the law of God, it's the law of men. That's what the Catholic Church is all about. It's the words of men, and they hold that above the word of God. And they claim it is the law of God, and it is God's commands. No, it isn't. It's their commands. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Before it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth, gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We're no longer in bondage when you get saved to, to the law of sin and death. But as, then he hath, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. How many of us, brothers and sisters, Christ get persecuted because we don't go to these Babel buildings? All these people, when you look into them, that are persecuting you, saying, in order to be a good Christian, great Christian, or even be a Christian, you need to be in these Babel buildings on Sunday. And you look at them, they fall under those people right there, born after the flesh. In other words, they're still in bondage to the law of sin and death. We are now of the spirit of life, uh, the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the law of sin, but not sin and death. Death gets dropped when we get saved. But it's showing these lost people are going to uh, persecute us who are saved and try to bring us back into bondage. Are we seeing that today, brothers and sisters of Christ? This um, Protestant Cataclysm, that's what it's doing. It's trying to bring people back under bondage. Next question, what is the testimony of Justin Martyr in the second century? Why don't you try using the Bible? This is supposed to be for kids and they're brainwashing people when they're young. I want to call it brainwashing, but at some point People use that word to say that as an excuse, but at some point when they get older, God's going to bring them to the truth. Or if they really want to know the truth, God will bring them to it. If they have no love of the truth and don't want it, you're on your own. But if they really were seeking the truth, God would show it to them. But it's really messing up children. So their answer, that on the Lord's day all Christians meet together for worship, to the reading of scripture, exhortation, and a celebration to celebrate the Lord's Supper. They keep throwing that in there, the Lord's Supper, because they take that part we talked about of breaking bread and saying, you see, we're supposed to do communion every Sunday, the Eucharist. Uh, no, we're not. You do that every once in a while. There's times that I'll go buy some bread and get some grape juice, and I will set and as I'm eating the bread and I'm drinking the juice, I thank God for salvation. And I talk with the Lord about my life and just examine my life. Am I truly living for the Lord? Have I fallen back into sin and temptation? Am I doing things I'm supposed to be doing? I go through my life and I give God glory for everything and give Him thanks for everything. That's what it's supposed to be about. Uh, you're supposed to be doing that a lot. But I'm talking about the actual fix, physical eating the bread and drinking the wine. But communion, you do it a lot should be doing it every day. Sanctifying yourself every day. And um, to sanctify him through thy truth, thy word is truth. And this is how you sanctify yourself. Not man's words, God's words. Now, I wanted to say testimonies are good. But remember, a good testimony, any testimony, going to have God's word in it. When I give a testimony about my life,
talk about repentance, how I repented for godly sorrow, work with repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work of death. Okay? I had the sorrows of the world. I was sorry for the consequences when my life was falling apart. That's what the, where the sorrow was coming from. I had to get to a point where I was broken, and that sorrow turned to godly sorrow. It's the only way repentance works is godly sorrow for sinning against Him. Only way. I kind of laugh. I'll go ahead and say this. I had to laugh a little bit because I had a guy make comments under one of my videos, and he deleted the comments. But he made comments under there that Paul wasn't really an apostle, and you're going off of Paul's writing, and I go off of Jesus' writings, and it's like, okay, he's not a Bible believer. Okay. And he was going off another Bible. When I found out that he was using another Bible, what can you do? You preach the gospel to him. And um, I linked him the Bible version issue. When I catch someone using a Bible version, uh, he was going off the Geneva Bible, and I found a lot of errors in the Geneva Bible. Um, he was going off of that. And I was like, okay, at this point, I'm going to link the, uh, the Bible version issue, and the gospel, the true gospel, can only be found here. But when you give a testimony, whether it's about the gospel or you're giving a testimony about something that God did for you that was amazing, you need to have God's word in it. Okay, now we're supposed to give God thanks in all things. Lord, thank you for this. Good testimonies have the word of God in with it. Where are these testimonies being backed by scripture? They're not. Now I had to put it in here, there's no Lord's Day. Okay? Jesus rose from the dead once. We are not sac we're not to sacrifice Him and raise Him up every Sunday. Well, it's remembering the Lord. The Lord's Day is us remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are we not supposed to do that every day? Doesn't the Bible say we're to pick up our cross daily? We're supposed to remember what Jesus did for us every day. Not just once a week. Here it gets kind of interesting. Next question. How should we keep the Lord's day? Answer. We should worship God in His church and make it a day of religious improvement. There you have the word religious, religion. Once again, I have to say chapter and verse. John 4.20. If you want to turn to John 4.20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And when they say his church there, I'm going to stop there for a second. When they say his church, they're talking about a building. you got to come together in a building. In a specific place, the same place all the time. And that place is called the church, not the people. Uh, John 4.20 Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor ye at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. Is that not true for these people in these Babel buildings? They claim to be worshiping Jesus Christ, but they're worshiping Satan, an antichrist. Okay? They know not what they worship. A lot of them will be shocked. Uh, I was shocked when I truly got born again how I was actually worshiping Satan in these Babel buildings. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. What's going on here? God's saying that Jesus is saying, which is God, that these places are where people are saying you have to worship a specific place. But there's going to come a time where you worship anywhere. You worship in your home. You worship the Lord when you're in the garden, gardening. You worship the Lord when you're sitting out on the deck, walking on the beach, when you're at your job doing work. Men that are out there working. Okay? You're to worship God everywhere. And you do it in spirit and in in spirit and in truth. Thy word is truth. It's got to be backed by scripture. Okay? 
You say, what about people working jobs? Where is that in the scripture? The Bible says if a man provide not for his own, he is worse than an infidel. Okay. I'm trying to say that from memory, but I'm quoting scripture. If I screw that up, Paul, I don't have it in my notes. Okay. It's in scripture. Now, you're supposed to worship him anywhere and every day. Next question that they throw out here. Remember, that's this them for religious improvement. Okay. One thing I didn't put on here, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. We're supposed to do that every day. And we talked about communion. Communion, spiritual, it's supposed to be done every day. The physical, you, should do, you can do it every once in a while if you want to. But you're supposed to be reevaluating your life and remembering what Jesus Christ did for you every day. Next question. What may we do on Sunday besides our religious duties? Uh-oh. This sounds a lot like the Sabbath day. There are certain things you can do and there are certain things you couldn't do. Okay. Answer. Works of necessity and works of mercy, such as visiting the sick and feeding the hungry. If I wanted to work out in the garden, that's not necessity. Uh... I go out there and I water every other day. When summer gets hitting really hot, I might. I'm still not supposed to water every day because the more waterlogged you do the roots, the less growth and uh, abundance that you get of the food, the vegetables. But it's not considered a necessity. Uh, if your car gets a flat, I guess it's a necessity. I'm trying to think of things. Bottom line, there's a lot of things you can't do. I want to go walk on the beach and have fun. That's work. I sweat. I hunt down agates and uh, sea glass. Nope, can't do that on Sunday. Now, notice it said such as visiting the sick and feeding the hungry. Well, Jesus was doing this any day of the week. Okay. They will say unto you, let's see, let's, they will say you can do it any day of the week, but isn't it interesting that this is mostly done on Sundays? You've got the soup kitchen. We do our fun, uh, we feed the homeless, and they do it on Sunday after church and everything, most times. I don't know how often it's going on today. A lot of them are just not doing any of this stuff anymore. Remember, because I got told that when I was in need as a, as a young adult, as a false Christian, I had put, given so much work, so much time, and donated money when I hardly made any money. And when I got fired and had a hard time, they told me that's not what we're here for when I turned to the church for help. Okay? It's a business. It's all about making money, not giving it to the poor and the sick and the hungry. Okay? Now, remember, you look up the Sabbath day and holy days. There were specific things you were allowed to do and specific things you weren't allowed to do. Certain holy days you were allowed to, and we're going to read it real quick. Colossians 2.16 let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a ho uh, and holi holy day. I almost want to say holiday. Holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So there we get those. Uh, you have holy days. They talk about the new moon, the, the new year. I'm guessing that's part of the new year. Someone can explain that more in the, in the comment section if they can find it in scripture, uh, or the Sabbath days. Holy days and Sabbath days. You don't have holiday, holidays, I'm sorry, holly. You don't have holidays and the, and the Lord's Day. Okay. Holy days, I'll go back to this again. Holy days and the Sabbath days are ordained of God. You're commanded to keep them and told what day to keep them, or days, plural. Some of the holy days go multiple days. Okay. Uh, when to do it, how to keep it, and the consequences for not keeping it. Leviticus 23, verse 34, the Old Testament. I want to show that some Sabbath days, work can be done, and what it was is the holy day itself fell on a Sabbath day. So it was a holy day, and that, cir that circumvented the Sabbath day where you couldn't do any work. Let's read this real quick. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days unto the Lord. 
See, it's a holy day that has more than one day. On the first day shall be an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. We looked at this. Servile work has to do with work that's not necessary. Does that sound familiar for what we just read there? Question and answer. You're not supposed to do any servile work. You're telling me that this whole thing about going to church on Sunday is not trying to bring people back under the law, but the laws of men, but back under the Sabbath law? They're just changing it to Sunday? So I just still believe what we're going through here, they're turning Sunday into the Sabbath day. And they're trying to claim it's a holy day or the Sabbath day. Are we supposed to keep that? You can if you want to, but if you don't, you don't have to. We read about that. Next question, did our Savior set us this example? Okay. Qu answer, yes, for he healed the sick on the Sabbath day. Let that sink in. Yeah, he healed people on the Sabbath day, and the Sadducees were trying to get onto him for it. But here's, a, here's a, a, something that might come as a shock. He healed on any day of the week. He healed on the Sabbath day, but he healed any day of the week. Okay. But they use this to say he healed on the Sabbath day. He was getting attacked saying it wasn't servile work. You know what I'm saying? It was extra works. It was work that wasn't supposed to be done on the Sabbath day. So, right there, that question right there says, who sets the example? And here's the thing. They put it in their own words. For he, yes, for he healed the sick on the Sabbath. Okay, He healed people that had um, missing an arm, that were blind. Okay, uh, Some of them that he walked by, I love that story about the ten, I think it was lepers, where he told them to go wash themselves and the um, not waters of Siloam, but in these waters, go wash yourself and present yourself to the priest. It's still Old Testament. And only one of the men came back to him to give him glory in it. But was this done on the Sabbath day? I'd have to read it again. But he's, he's healing people all the time. There's times where he's healing people where it's not the Sabbath day. He's teaching on the Sabbath day and he's healing on the Sabbath day. I'm not denying that. But where is the scripture for this? This they could have pulled up scripture for and said, okay, here's the scripture saying that Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. There's no scripture in there. They're getting you to go off of man's words. Like I said, if you're going to say God says this and we're supposed to do this, you quote scripture and then you can explain scripture, but you better be quoting scripture. Next question, how did the Jews feel when they saw that Jesus healed the sick on the Sabbath day? Answer, they were offended and sought to destroy him. Now, two things here. Once again, could they have grabbed scripture to back this up? Absolutely. Did they back up, use scripture to back it up? Absolutely not. It's man's words. Okay? When you don't use scripture to back it up, it's just man's words. The other thing to get from this is when it says they were offended and sought to destroy him. How is this reaction any different towards us who preach and teach any day of the week and are against the Lord's Day as far as their made-up, man-made holiday every Sunday? How is that any difference? We have Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries, mainly Bible-believing ministries online, and all of us get attacked. And one of the biggest attacks... I mean, if I'm wrong, prove it to me through Scripture. But one of the main attacks that we get is, you need, I need to shave, put on a suit and tie, and go to these Babel buildings. Okay, they, they seek to destroy our ministry because we don't have a Babel building. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee before, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He appears, the appearing there, I believe, uh, catching away. Uh, oh, so shall judge the dead, uh, the catching away, and then his kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Okay. To me, it's any day of the week. 
reprove, you're supposed to do it in multiple days. You're not supposed to do it the same day of the week every week. You're supposed to do it at different times. Um, I'm right now, I started, a lot of my time is going towards doing Bible studies, and now I'm just starting to get outdoors. I had to get the garden done and get some work done. It's been, been taking a toll on me. But I started a Bible study that it's okay to do a Bible study the same day every week, but one time we almost didn't get to do it on Saturday, and I'm like, well, let's bump it to Sunday. We don't need to skip a week. We can do it Sunday. We can do it Friday. We can move it. But I talk with the brethren on Skype all the time about the Word of God on any day of the week. Okay. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but at their, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. All these people they're they're mentioning these are teachers. There's a, uh, I think the one guy was a bishop, the Antioch bishop of Antioch, uh, Ignatius. Okay, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. I'm shown in Scripture, there is no Lord's Day. The Bible says we're to pick up our cross daily. We're to remember what Jesus did for us every day. We're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus all the time. Let's see. And they shall oh, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The Lord's Day is just a fable. It's not backed by scripture. Okay. It's a lowercase l Lord's Day. They try to put a capital L on it. It's a lowercase l Lord's Day. Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Make full proof of, your, of thy ministry. What's the fruit of these Babel buildings? Most of it is... I don't know if you heard that, but the rooster. Most of it is based off of Bible perversions, not the King James Bible. It's based off of men's words, and they start pulling you away from the Bible. Even these so-called King James Bible-believing buildings, they're starting to pull you away from the truth and get you onto the traditions of men, and you hold the traditions of men above the Word of God. Okay, They've proven that their ministry is false. Okay? Hopefully brothers and sisters in Christ, I've proven that my ministry is true, okay? My doctrine, all everything that was there, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I teach these things. I try to exhort people. I try to encourage people. I correct people. It says long suffering. We're not to lose our temper. We're not supposed to get agitated. We're supposed to be long suffering. We're supposed to teach proper doctrine. Okay. For the time will come when they not endure sound doctrine. But they're going off the words of men. Acts 5, verse 29. Okay. What did Peter say? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Now Peter's saying this, but for us, because it's God's word, what's it telling us? We're supposed to obey God rather than men. When men start going against the word of God, we follow this right here, and we don't follow them. Okay, next question. What did Jesus say to them? This is going back where he's talking about he healed the sick on the Sabbath. Did people get mad? and oh, They were offended and sought to destroy him like they do us, Bible-believing Christians. Question. What did Jesus say to them? Answer. That the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now here's the thing, they didn't quote scripture again. This time I, I actually went to the scripture, probably sh I should have done it on these other two, so hey, they could have found scripture. Uh, but this one, Mark chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, have ye never read what David did when he had need and was a hungered, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar and the, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him? And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. 
Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. There's where they could have quoted it, but they didn't quote it. But notice it says that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. You read the context and you see that the Pharisees were the ones trying to be the Lords of the Sabbath. And that's what's going on with this Lord the Lord's Day. They're trying to be like the Pharisees, and they're the Lords of the Lord's Day, if you want to say. But it's, they're, like I said, it's just it's just the Sabbath day, except on Sunday. We read that. Okay? They say what goes on and what doesn't go on. Now, are we talking about the Lord's Day? I'm going to keep throwing this in. Are we talking about the Sabbath day or the Lord's Day? See how they're making Sunday the new Sabbath day. It's not about the Lord's resurrection. Did we celebrate the Lord's resurrection every Sunday in the Babel buildings? Today, we don't. But they do do communion uh, in the Babel buildings. But it, it's, it's, uh, but it started out where they did. Every Sunday, communion. And they're trying to push, like I said, it's supposed to be a Protestant cataclysm. It is Catholic disguised. Okay? Protestantism, if I can say it like that, it's all about reforming the Catholic Church. They didn't separate themselves from the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is 100% wrong, false, satanic. You don't want to keep any part of it. You need to come out of her completely. Okay? They weren't. They're just Catholics. They like, like Some people like to say... Closet Catholics. Now the next question they ask is, what does this mean? The answer, that the Sabbath day was made for the benefit of man, therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Okay. Where, is that what they were doing? No, they were eating corn. They were plucking corn. They were getting food on the Sabbath day. Okay. Uh, the do good part, when... Uh, Jesus was talking about it when he, he brought the man that was, I can't remember if he was missing an arm or if he was blind. Um, but he brought him in front of everybody and asked everybody, is it good to do good on the, la on the Sabbath day or evil? That's a good thing when he healed and helped that person. Okay? So is it lawful to do good any other day of the week? Is it lawful to do good on Monday? Is it lawful to do good on Tuesday? And so on and so forth. Okay? Is it, lawful, is it lawful to preach, teach, fellowship any other day of the week? According to them, uh, they'll say sure, but they make it out to be a big deal that it has to be at least Sunday. If that's the only day of the week that you're going to do it, it has to be Sunday and in those buildings. Question, what must we bear in mind? Here's what it really gets to you. First answer, that the spirit of the command, and it thou shalt do no manner of work, remains in full force and forbids all pursuit of worldly business or pleasure. If you're not getting this by now, brothers and sisters of Christ, it's just going on and it's changing the Sabbath day to a Sunday. That's all it is. All they are doing is, is changing the Sabbath day from the last day of the week to the first day. And they're trying to disguise it and say it's the Lord's day. Colossians 2.16 let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. I ought to have no problem doing scripture more than once in a study. Okay, Once again, okay, I'm not supposed to judge a man. If a man wants to work that day, if you have to go to work to bring in income to provide for your own, you have to work Sunday, there's nothing wrong with that. But according to them, there is. Romans chapter 14, verse, 15, uh, verse 5. Romans 14, 5. Here we see it again. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And we go back through and you can read it again. He that regardeth the day regardeth it to the Lord, and so forth. Okay, once again, they're saying that you can't do this. Yeah, you can, as long as you're doing it to the Lord. You give God glory for your job. A lot of people pray because there's a lot of wickedness and filth in the jobs that they do. Have to listen, hear satanic music. If you're working at Fred Meyer's, there's times when I walk through Fred Meyer's. You have a job, you're providing for your own, but you listen to the music they're playing, and it's just filthy. Some of the stuff that's, a lot of the stuff that's on the shelves, it's wicked. 
Right? I understand that a lot of you are praying for a better job in the sense that it's you can be abstain from all appearance of evil, but you're still giving God thanks that you have a job. You have an income that you can give God glo uh, glory in. And thanks for helping you provide for your family. You still do a, your best to do 100% in that job because you're doing it to the Lord. Uh, two more questions and we're done. Question, what else should we remember? Answer, that we are not to make work of charity an excuse for being absent from the house of God when we may do them before and after service. Now where did this come from? It's not in scripture. So at first they're saying, hey, you can do good works, you know, charity work and and feeding the homeless on, on Sunday. It's okay. But you still have to be in that Babel building. It's not to uh, take place in that Babel building you know, on the Lord's Day. But when we read, Paul was talking about coming and collecting everything and going to Jerusalem on the Lord's Day to give stuff to the homeless and everything. It wasn't about coming together and preaching the word and everything. He's just coming by to pick up the stuff and go give to the homeless. So evidently, Paul, you were wrong in what you did, according to them. And I'm being sarcastic, okay? Basically, they're trying to control people. It's, it's the new Sabbath. The Sunday thing is just the new Sabbath. Uh, question, not according to Scripture. I'm not adding to Scripture. I'm taking, saying to them... And to you, brothers and sisters of Christ, they're just taking the Sabbath and moving it to Sunday. Question. Last question. What does St. Paul say of Christian worship? This is the one they always use, trying to use it against us, who don't reject these Babel buildings and will have nothing to do with them other than to preach against them that they're wrong and they're false. They're pagan temples. Okay. Uh, Hebrews. Our, their answer is, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. They didn't quote chapter and verse. They just said it. But we can turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Is that supposed to be done every day of the week? All the time? Any time? Absolutely. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Who's the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews. In the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to need fellowship. They're need to come together and to do all these things. Consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, to encourage each other not to take the mark of the beast. As the day approaching, okay, the day of the Lord is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It comes at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. So, once again, is this command written to us? Now this was a long study, and the battery died on me, so <laughs> we're going to have to go off the volume on this, so hopefully it doesn't hurt too much. The volume on there is not too bad, brothers and sisters of Christ. But as we see in here, what's going on here? They're just changing the Sabbath day to Sunday. That's all they're doing. And these Babel buildings, that's all it is. And then in these last days, they've got to conform to the world, and they become pleasers of men more than the pleasers of God. They've compromised the gospel. Now they've got satanic style music in the Bible buildings. And now you can do anything. I mean, we went and, when I was younger, we bought action figures for Star Wars. And we're talking about it at church. This new Star Wars movie is coming out. And we've got the tickets to go to Star Wars after church and after, you know, going to the Bible building. Because church is the body of Christ. You're in church 24-7. But the pastor's like, oh, that's, that seems great. That's cool. You know, you guys have a good time. Who was that? A servant of Satan. If he was really a man of God, he would have set us down and said, do you guys realize that's satanic and that's wicked? 
It's, it's based off a of false religion. There is no God. There is no good. There is no bad. It's just there's one force, and whatever you do with it determines whether it's good or bad. It's part of, of philosophy and false religion. And the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. There's, I still see people make comments online where they're st and they're, they're, they just love Star Wars and they keep, you know, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. You need to get Star Wars out of your life. But the point is, is that man wasn't setting us down and teaching us what's right. Oh, he's, it's okay, you can go, it's okay, it's no big deal. Conforming to keep us happy. People that are donating money. People that are doing work in these Bible buildings. Free labor. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, through this study, hopefully in the past, you can understand that even in the past, they couldn't justify it with Scripture. They used traditions of men. They abused Scripture, misquoted Scripture, took Scripture out of context to try to get people to do the, the Catholic way. Build your building, call it a church, and then invite both saved and lost to it. Then you start laying out rules on what can be done and what can't be done. So, hopefully this has helped, uh, brother and sister Christ, so you get through this, you can get an understanding of what they're trying to pull, and what they're trying to pr push, and the verses they're trying to use. I'm just letting you know, through this study, how that originated, the Protestant Catechism, comes from the Catholic Church. They're just Catholics. This whole Sunday thing is Catholics uh, trying to be Jews. Okay? We replaced the Jews. You see a lot of people say, well, we replaced the Jews. They're just changing the Sabbath day to Sunday. So don't fall for this. Stay away from these Babel buildings. And please, please, brothers and sisters of Christ, I like to hear that you're worshiping the Lord, reading the Bible daily, worshiping the Lord daily, giving God thanks every day in all things, giving Him glory in all things, doing everything in the name of Jesus Christ every day. Do it every day, brothers and sisters of Christ. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.